eyes of the world are upon the centre of the world. It is the British Grand Prix at Silverstone, the halfway stage of the season, and we've got a Mercedes on the front row. Welcome to Crazy Silverstone. We move away from the dramatic and brilliant Austrian Grand Prix to the halfway stage of the season, the centre of the world and the centre of the country. It's Silverstone for the British Grand Prix. It's round 10 of the season. We've already had nine different races, three different winners. Max Verstappen was the first to break the Mercedes dominance. Two weeks time with the German Grand Prix at the Hockenheim before a week later the Hungarian Grand Prix for the summer break. Then we're back at the end of August and early September for the Belgian Grand Prix. Italy serves as round 14, the last stop on the European calendar, before Singapore, Russia, Japan, the Americas with Mexico, United States and Brazil. And we all round out on the 1st of December in Abu Dhabi. In terms of the Drivers' Championship, Lewis Hamilton leading the way, 197 points. His fifth place in Austria was his worst of the season. Bottas is closing him down. Verstappen is now the next up as well. And if you look down, still no points for George Russell or for Robert Kubica. And that means in terms of the Constructors' Championship, Williams still have no points coming into their home race on the anniversary of their first win 40 years ago. Haas F1 on 16, they're battling with Toro Rosso and Racing Point and Alpha. Renault and McLaren still battling it out. Ferrari and Red Bull still in the midst of their own because Mercedes are dominant in 2019. And joining me this afternoon for the British Grand Prix pre-race show, a man of many voices, of many talents. He's our pit lane reporter. Alongside me in the coverage box, it's our father, it's Ian Birch. Good afternoon, Dad. How are you ahead of Silverstone? Oh, Silverstone. You should have put a sign up to say I didn't know. I think your shirt gives it away a little bit with all 18 turns. Yes, all listed. Yes, uh, I'm, I would list them, but uh, Abbey, Farmker, Village, Loop... Aintree, Wellington Strait, Brooklands, Luffield, Woodcook, Cops, Maggots, Beckett's, Chapel, Hanger Strait, Stowe, Vale Club. Oh, you mentioned Stowe? Yeah, Stowe Corner. I've renamed it. What do you mean? Matt's House. Yeah, Matt's House. Matt's our cousin, by the way. Good afternoon, Matt. Hi, and, and good afternoon, Megan, who's alongside. And Megan Birch is hitting me already, you can tell. But uh, good afternoon, Megan, a girl who has been off Brendan Hartley's Christmas list for the past two seasons. Good afternoon, Megan. How are you today? Yeah, you get, uh, get to speak. You started off putting Rose in order, though you went wrong. When did I go wrong? Aintree, the second corner. Aintree's not the second corner. Oh, yes. Oh, well. Aintree is. Oh, well, there you go. You learned the other day. Went wrong on a few of them, actually. So, anyway. Um, well, they go through that fast nowadays, don't they? Yeah, when yeah. You think about it. The speed they go down, down. I mean, Martin Brundle's just been on about it, about the fact that they take a lot of these corners fast, and it, it's bad on the neck, isn't it, as well? Because it's... Uh, they're going so fast nowadays through those corners like that, like that. Mm. And the neck. That's why they all do those um, elastic things around the neck and go like that. Megan, it's incredibly windy. It's around the neck. Megan, it's incredibly windy where we are today in our studio and that wind's going to blow down towards Silverstone. But there's also a chance of rain. Now, you predict in the podcast in Austria a wet race. Are you, sta are you standing by that? Yes, well, I hope it isn't because then it'll be a short race. Yeah, but it's British Grand Prix Sunday, and we were commentating on qualifying yesterday, and it was dramatic with the loads of threat of rain. Yeah, it's been raining this morning in the uh, G uh, F2 race and F3 yeah. race. Morning, mainly the F2 race, right? And he calls Jack Aitken as a winner, we must say. So congratulations British to Jack. winner at the British Grand Prix. And if we had that this afternoon, it'd be even better. But yeah, of course it will. Yeah. But yeah. I want Lewis to win, all, as always. But is the rain going to play a factor this afternoon? Megan says it is. What do you say? Well... By the look of the rain that's coming in, yeah. Excellent. It's um, might miss it though. Oh, might well. come, might come just after the race. Oh. Might have, to, might have to get a hat to an umbrella for Simon. Yes, well he's not wearing it, is he? Well, he won't. His trousers won't matter because if uh, Verstappen <laughs> wins, <laughs> he'll have the leather lederhosen's on. Yes. Right. Let's go on to qualifying report. Then yesterday it was very dramatic. Dad, join me in the commentary box. But this is what happened in qualifying. <laughs> 
So qualifying for the British Grand Prix on Saturday was absolutely fantastic. One of the best qualifyings of the year, mainly due to the unpredictable nature of the weather. Was it going to rain? Where would it rain? What part of the track would it affect? It started raining at Club Corner, then it went away, then it came back at Stowe, then it went away again. So all the time we were thinking, where is it going to come? How far is it going to come? How bad is it going to come? But still, qualifying was dramatic. Let's start, as ever, with what happened in qualifying one as Hamilton set the early pace as Magnussen falls out early. After the sprinkles of rain that fell during free practice three, the first segment of qualifying got underway on a dry track, albeit under angry looking skies, as we said just a second ago. Soft tyres were the, the order of the day for everyone except for Ferrari, who opted for the medium tyres. Not that you would have noticed from the times. Hamilton emerged from FP from our Q1 in P1, a new track record as well, a 1 minute 25.513. But Leclerc was only two hundredths of a second back. That's the impressive thing with the Ferrari on the medium tyres. And half a second slower they should be. Two tenths, not that bad at all. Less than two hundredths, sorry. Fantastic. Give me a glimpse of what Ferrari had coming in Q2. Vettel looked uh, comfortable uh, as well compared to his teammate, but then fell off at the end of the session. He came fifth fastest, switching to the softs midway through, but abandoning a lap when it came clear he was safe behind Verstappen and Bottas. Fail falling in the first hurdle, unfortunately, yet again, were our Q1 regulars of Robert Kibitza, George Russell and Lance Stroll all being eliminated from the session. 14th consecutive time for Lance Stroll as well being eliminated. Toro Rosso's Danny Kvyat also extends his three straight Q1 exits. Kevin Magnussen, meanwhile, took an early bath for the first time since Mexico last season. Racing point Sergio Perez saved himself at the death across the line as well. But it wasn't that. Magnussen's elimination was even a sharper context by the fact that he was quicker in Austria two weeks ago when he qualified in fifth. Out in qualifying one was Kevin Magnussen. Uh, Danny Kvyat, Lance Stroll, George Russell and Robert Kubica. On to qualifying two then and his first appearance for Ferrari at the British Grand Prix it was Charles Leclerc who put it on top in qualifying two. As usual all eyes were on which tyres the top contenders were going to qualify on. Were they going to qualify on the mediums or the softs? With the cloud above the logical suggestion would have been to put the mediums on as you could then get longer in the race tomorrow which seems to be dry and um, with a chance of rain. But both Mercedes and Red Bulls went with the more durable mediums, as did the Clare initially. Vettel stuck with the soft compound tyre. Very unusual for him to do so as well. So, I mean, without seeing much boosting performance, urge of those around him, Vettel still stuck in on the softs compounds. The Clare set the pace for switching to the softs and improving late on, so he starts on the soft compound tyres as well. So Ferrari on the softs, Mercedes and Red Bull on the medium tyres for the race. Ferrari made their strategy clear for the race. Bottas was second quickest, also bolted on the red wall tyres late on, but abandoning his effort, starts on the mediums, along with his teammate Lewis Hamilton, third quickest in the segment, ahead of Verstappen in fourth, and Gasly finished in sixth. At the other end of the timesheets, though, the usual uh, battle to make Q3 cut left the two British-born rookie stars, Lando Norris, out of qualifying as well. Out qualifying, sorry. His Miss McLaren teammate, Carlos Sainz, for the seventh time this season in ten races. The Spaniard failed to reach Q3 for the third year running here at Silverstone. Out then in qualifying two, Antonio Giovinazzi, Kimi Raikkonen, Carlos Sainz, Roman Grosjean and Sergio Perez. On to qualifying three then, and this was the big one. The clouds begin to clear at Silverstone. Everyone was going to set a dry time. So is it going to be a new track record? We already saw that in qualifying one, but who could beat it in Q3? Well, Bottas keeps his cool and takes the closest pole in a decade. Six thousandths of a second separated Valtteri Bottas and Lewis Hamilton on the front row of the grid. That is the closest pole in 10 years since 2009 when Vettel outqualified Alonso by three thousandths of a second. Absolutely fantastic. Over the first two runs, Bottas were edging faster as well. 0.25 was the gap overall. Hamilton made a clear mistake at Brooklyn's. Ferrari, meanwhile, were only fourth and sixth after their first runs. Leclerc admitting he made an error and to trying something. He'd been a lot closer after to the second rounds. Bottas and Hamilton first to play their hands with the home fans on their feet as Hamilton came past in his outlap. Uh, as well, 
he was he was missed out on five poles by just six thousandths of a second as he improved, but Bottas didn't, so that's why the gap is six thousandths of a second. Mercedes are set to hold on to their record of taking every pole position here at Silverstone since 2013. Not bad at all. Uh, France are back and sees the clear was rapid, but only did purple sectors in sector one and two. Sector three, he was down. He starts third on the grid as well. An incredibly close battle for Sunday's race with the two Mercedes up front and Charles Leclerc just behind. The top three separated by less than a tenth of a second. The closest front row in a decade and the closest top three in Formula E history, Formula One history, sorry, since 1997 at Jerez when the top three set identical lap times. We've got an incredible British Grand Prix ahead of us. <laughs> And this is how they line up for the British Grand Prix then. Vatimi Bottas on pole position with the smallest pole margin in 10 years. Lewis Hamilton alongside just six thousandths of a second separate them. Charles Leclerc lines up on row two alongside Max Verstappen. Then it's Pierre Gasly, Sebastian Vettel, Daniel Ricciardo, Lando Norris in the top eight as well. And rounding out the top ten on row five, Alexander Albon and Nico Hülkenberg. Antonio Giovinazzi, Kimi Raikkonen, Carlos Sainz, Roman Grosjean, Sergio Perez, Kevin Magnussen, Danny Kvyat, Lance Stroll, Ro uh, George Russell and Robert Kubica in 20th. Now I want to get on to you, to you Dad, because we were commentating qualifying. The big surprise was nearly that Sebastian Vettel was nearly eliminated in qualifying too. Yeah, they gave a god a big surprise there, didn't they? Yes. Um, I've never seen I've never seen him go so fast around that track to actually catch up. He really was within half a lap of not qualifying, uh, but um, he did it. That's that's Seb. He's professional, isn't he? And um, Megan would have watched it, but she she could have staked a claim for it. But she was out with her sister, um, having a lovely steak, were not you, Dal? And I wanted to bring that in because where you had dinner is actually what turn one is named after. Abby uh, was where you had lunch yesterday as well. Was it a good lunch while we were slaving the comment box? Yes, I had peppercorn sauce, steak, uh, um, rocket uh, salad and chips. Now, I want to ask you about qualifying yesterday. Mercedes on the front row. Lovely. It does sound lovely. Your beautiful older sister. That's a plug in there for Kellyanne who's watching. Uh, she had the chicken. She had the chicken. Uh, just quick then. Uh, we've got Valtteri Bottas and Lewis Hamilton on pole position, six thousandths of a second separating them in qualifying, the smallest in ten years. But Hamilton's got the inside line. You know what the inside line's like, as you always look to the front. Can Hamilton get past Bottas at the start? Probably. The British fans give us a second per lap for British drivers. Is that going to be on Hamilton's side today? Yes. Excellent. Right. Well, if you give him a second a lap, then hopefully Lando will overtake a few people and be up to second or third place. Lando starts eighth and the McLaren is still very dominant. Now that leads us on to another feature is lap attack. Now it's Mercedes lockout on the front row of the grid. Mercedes have had polio every year since 2013. And this is how it looks on board in their new W10 on a new lap attack. <laughs> Let's take a lap then of Silverstone in the 2019 Mercedes W10. Out of the last corner, club across the line and start the clock. Down towards turn one of Abbey. It's a seventh gear corner, flat out as you go through farm curve, approaching the first real breaking point on the circuit into turn three of Village. Down all the way, third gear, tight right, or a tight left at the loop. Second gear corner, fall opposite long because you get the car straightened up for the fire at turn five through a tree, DRS open, head down the way to straight now, already up into eighth gear, get ready to drop down the gears now into fourth gear as you come round the long double barrel Brooklands, into left field now, drop down to third gear, get the power on mid corner so you get a better exit as you head through Woodcook Curve across the national pitch straight where Formula E, Moto GP and British Touring Cars are through Cops Corner, flat out seventh gear, little lift, little bit wide at the moment the level of downforce and now for the most famous section maggots and beckets hamilton loves this section flat out through maggots little break and a lift through beckets as well drop down fifth gear to get the better exit out of the second part into chapel open up the drs now in eighth gear as you go down the hangar straight towards stowe corner one of the most famous overtakes happened here back in 1987 remember fifth gear corner stowe get the power on it's a nice lovely flowing corner big you can bite the rain as we head down now to Vale, the complex down now into turn 16 and 17. Then the last corner, turn 18 on the track, is club corner, flat out and across the line for a lap of Silverstone. 
And this is a wonderful circuit here at Silverstone. And today marks 40 years exactly since Williams first won their first Grand Prix with Clay Regazzoni. But it's also their 50th year in the sport. But how did it all begin? Here's a lovely feature celebrating 50 years of Williams and the man behind it all, Sir Frank Williams. Across Formula One's 70-year history, there have been many remarkable individuals that have moulded the sport into what it is today. Sir Frank Williams might just be the most remarkable. Born Francis Owen Garbett Williams in the northeast of England in South Shields, during the Second World War on the 16th of April 1942, Frank was destined to be in motorsport, but his future didn't lie behind the cockpit of the wheel and eventually found himself dealing in racing cars. In 1966, Frank Williams started the Frank Williams Racing Team with his driver, Piers Courage. They started together in Formula 2 before graduating to Formula 1 50 years ago in 1969. The team's only car was a second-hand Brabham chassis and the team at the time was a skeleton staff. Despite all the odds, the team finished on the podium in only their second race at Monaco and also claimed a second place in the United States Grand Prix at Watkins Glen. However, the team hit tragedy just one year later in 1970 as its driver, Piers Courage, tragically died during the Dutch Grand Prix at Zandvoort. Sir Frank was devastated, but didn't want to lose out on his and Piers' dream of racing in Formula One, so nobly continued the sport. With debt mounting up as the seasons passed, Sir Frank sold his Williams team to businessman Walter Wolff in 1976. Frank stayed on at the Wolf team as team principal in 1976, but decided to try again. And in 1977, Williams Racing Engineering was born, Frank's second Formula One team. So Frank teamed up with an ambitious young engineer by the name of Patrick Head, who only the previous year had hired him at Wolf. At first, the team were based out of an old carpet warehouse, but after signing the young, fast Australian driver of Alan Jones and a sponsorship deal from the Middle East, the team had finally become players at the top half of the field. The team claimed its first podium in 1978 and just one year later came into its own with five victories in the later half of 1979. The first of which was here at Silverstone, exactly 40 years ago to the day, a fitting place for a first victory. In 1980, Alan Jones won the Drivers' Championship and Williams secured back-to-back -back Drivers' and Constructors' titles in 1980 and 1981. However, just as Williams were finding its feet, in 1986, Frank suffered a life-changing crash injury after what happened at France on the way back from Paul Ricard. Severely paralysed, the doctors consulted Sir Frank's wife Ginny about turning off his life support. She refused, and Sir Frank cheated death and returned to the sport to run the team. Williams won the 1986 Constructors' Championship and both titles the following year. Over the next 33 years, Williams has cemented itself as one of the most dominant teams in Formula 1 history, with seven drivers' titles, nine constructors' titles and 114 race victories, all under Sir Frank's rule. Now 77, Sir Frank is the world's longest living terraplegic and still the figurehead of his team, Williams. They have built some of the finest cars in Formula 1 history. They have raced some of the finest drivers in the sports history. And behind all of that for the past 50 years is one man, Sir Frank Williams. Now, with his three children, including Claire Williams, who is the deputy team principal at the moment of Williams, she gave birth to a son last year, ensuring that the Williams name will live on forevermore in Formula 1. Dan, I'm coming to you now, because after that lovely tribute as well, William's been in the sport now for 50 years. Most successful team. It's a pity to see them so far back down the grid today. Yeah, if, they, if you get your aero wrong, that's it. It's gone. And yes, it is a family atmosphere. You know, Sir Frank's got um, his daughter and both his sons there and his grandkids and his uh, son-in-law. Um, yeah. And um, he's not the only one because um certain person, Charlie, mm. who, who they lost, right, um, his his son will start the race today. 
And that is going to be emotional to see as well after the Australian Grand Prix. Megan, Williams at the back, but they've got George Russell and Robert Kubica. They're the two right drivers in the right place to help develop that team. But my question is, if one of them has to go, who do you think will go to Williams? I don't know. Well, Eddie Jordan knows, and apparently he says Charles Leclerc. I don't know where he got that one from, because why would he leave Ferrari? Why would he go to Williams with their present problems unless unless there's a miracle? I think it was just uh, AJ just doing yeah. AJ things. Um, if anything, I think they'll take someone from uh, GP2, or F2, as it is now, right? And um, Young Vips yeah. is my favourite driver at the moment in that category. In Formula 3. Apart from the one who won, who was a Brit. Jack Aiken. Megan's tapping me again, as she always does. What do you say? Um... Do you know what I think about uh, Nikki's kids? Nikki Louders or yeah. Charlie's kids? Nikki Louders. Nikki Louders. Yeah. Um, I think we'll see two more drivers maybe since he has, well, he had two eight-year-olds. Yeah, he's got two eight-year-old sons, hasn't he? Yes, so we'll see them. Son, oh, is it a son and a daughter? He has got twins. Yeah, there's W W series now, so you know, yeah. and and. We nearly had a situation yesterday where for the first time ever in a major race, mm. th I, I was willing it on, but she just couldn't do it. Tatiana didn't go in for a pit stop. And it, I know it was technical, but it wouldn't have been lovely for, for a woman to have, w have been leading the F2 race. Yeah, it's, it's about yeah. time. I mean, in IndyCar, we've had some tremendous women drivers, right? And um, Danica's, uh, Danica Patrick won, of course, in... Uh, Oh, yeah, and she Montegi. she actually nearly um, won the yeah, yeah, 500. Yeah, yeah, she yeah. had was that she lost it on the last lap. So yeah, yeah it's about time to. Right, let's end the show because we're getting Miss close Chadwick. to time. Oh, Jamie Chadwick. Yeah. Miss Chadwick is going to be a star. Watch this space. And you can watch that on Channel 4 as well, where you can watch today's race live as well, and it's also live on Sky Sports F1. Now. Me and Megan have got to get to the commentary box. You've got to get mic'd up as well because we're about five minutes away from the start of the race. So Megan and me after the commentary box, you're off to race control. I want your two's predictions for this race. It's sunshine at the moment, but the clouds could turn any moment. Your prediction for top three? Um, Sebastian Lewis, but in the other order. I want Lewis to win, right? But I think Sebastian will have something to show everybody today. It's better weather today. You know, it's more like Sebastian's weather. And um, third place um, between Valtteri and Max. Megan, your question? I have a feeling it's going to be Bottas, Hamilton, uh, Leclerc. Oh, that's an interesting top three, isn't it? Bottas, Hamilton, Don't Leclerc. Don't you feel, though, that um, Charles, because of his um, lack of experience, um, seems to bottle it in big races? Yeah, yeah, it does seem that way, doesn't it? And that's, that's the hardest yeah. things. Yeah. Excellent. Right. Where was <laughs> Megan's friend, Brendan? Um, Brendan Hartley. Enemy. <laughs> Megan. <laughs> you used to seem to bottle it in every race. Yeah, well, he's, re he's off her Christmas card list now. I can't wait for the, the day you two actually meet. Right, that's it from us. We're off to the commentary box now. Dad, you're off to race control. But we'll be back on Tuesday for the podcast as well with all three of us analysing what is hopefully going to be a great race. And we'll be back, is it two weeks' time for the German Grand Prix? I'm going to do a DC. I'm gone. Yeah, all right. Bye-bye. Well, see, he's got to get to race control, you see, and that's further away than our commentary box, which is located just here. Megan, this is going to be a great race today, isn't it? Yep. Excellent. Right, let's get to the commentary box, and let's hope that you can watch the British Grand Prix, Channel 4, BBC Radio 5 Live, and Sky Sports F1 as well, all live. We'll see you Tuesday. Bye for now.